All right, in this video, I'm going to look at the paper, Generative Agents, Interactive Simulcra of Human Behavior. So what I'm going to do is go through the paper. I'm also going to reproduce some of this in GPT-4, and we're going to have a look at like how you would do these generative agents, etc., using some of the ideas from the paper if you wanted to do it yourself. So this paper is all about creating sort of autonomous agents that can at least have the illusion of thinking. So actually Simulcra is sort of creating like likenesses or a reflection, a representation of human behavior in here. And that's what they're trying to create in here. And they do it with a very nice little game. So we'll have a look at the game as well. They've put up a demo online where you can actually watch what's going on see the different agents and there's 25 of these agents going at a time and we can also see what they're doing so we can see a lot of them are asleep if we click on one of them it'll take us to where they are and we can actually watch what they're doing we can also see their current action here and the details about them this is very cool because it's doing 25 different agents at a time but really it's come up with a system for doing many agents so I don't see why this couldn't be scaled up to even a lot more agents. The only limitations are the pinging, the large language model, et cetera. So let's jump in and have a look at what this is and how it's doing. I'll point out that, so these are the authors up here. Percy Liang is probably the, the supervisor, I'm guessing, on this. He was also on the Alpaca paper and many other things that have come out of Stanford. Some of Google research people also on this paper. So they basically are setting out to create a way to make a simulation of human behavior and interactivity between humans and objects and humans and other humans here. To do that, they've created this sort of game world. And while the game world is quite nice for us to be able to see it, it's not the coolest thing. By far, how they've actually put it all together is really good. So they refer to this as their interactive sandbox environment that they've got going on here. So what they're basically doing is getting these generative agents and creating an architecture that allows them to use large language models to store records of memory, experience, and then to synthesize from those actions and planning that they can take for actions in the future. And it turns out that this works really well and brings out a lot of really interesting traits both in what they do and also how it's done so one of the examples is that one of the agents comes up with the idea of a valentine's day party and starts to spread that through conversation to other agents and then that the idea of that party gets spread right across the simulation and people actually end up showing up for this party that they've created themselves so I go through a, quite in depth in the paper. I'm not going to go through everything in the paper, but we're going to look at some of the key things that are going on here. The idea here is that they, you know, to enable these generative agents, they make this agent architecture. And this architecture basically stores memories, synthesizes things, and applies these relevant memories to generate believable behavior using a large language model. They talk about their architecture comprising of three parts. The memory stream, which we'll look at, the long-term memory module, and the natural language parts, which we'll also look at, and we'll try to recreate in GPT-4, just through playing around with this as well. They've also got a bunch of retrieval models, and then the, you know, that's all in the sort of first part. Then they've got this really interesting idea of reflection. So if you're a fan of Westworld, one of the whole sort of themes in Westworld was this idea of these agents reflecting back on their own memories and their own experiences. And that's kind of what this is doing, maybe not in the same way as Westworld, but they've got this you know, reflection idea which synthesizes memories into higher level inferences over time. And you could argue that's something that humans actually do. We take in what we see day to day, we then kind of chunk it together. And we basically get it to a point where if I ask you to describe a day from last week, you're probably not going to remember all the details, but you'll remember that, oh, yeah, I got in my car, I drove to this place, I met this person, those sorts of things. So that's sort of the higher level stuff. And the third thing that they're really aiming at is this planning, which the idea of here is to basically take some of these conclusions that they've come up with and pl plan out actions that they can take with this. Again, the generative agents is what you're seeing in the game. 
for me, by far the more interesting part is actually the architecture that they've come up with to do this. They also go into some evaluation stuff, which I won't go into the video to how they evaluate it. So they talk a little bit about different forms of believable proxies for human behavior, what sort of come before for this kind of thing. And people have tried some ideas like this using RL and they point out Alpha Star for StarCraft, the OpenAI 5 for Dota. But they point out that those things are much more adversarial, where you're trying to kill the opponent playing this game or something like that. Whereas here, they're looking much more for collaborative sort of things and more natural human behavior coming out of this. Another example of where people have done something like this in the past was came out of Salesforce, where they actually tried to get a, an AI with RL to manage a simulated economy, which was also very interesting. And I, I do wonder if the next step for some of this is to start going in that direction with the framework that these people have created. So you can see that this is their mock world. It's got a bunch of things like a park. It's got places that people can go to in their houses. It's got different parts in the house so people can move around. The generative agents can move around, can interact in these locations. All right. So you can see, first off, they talk about creating this idea of creating the agent. So they give an example here of a prompt to create an agent. And this is sort of key to a lot of this is that what they will do is create the agents and then they have like a, a time step in the game. So at every increment of time in the game, they ask each agent, what are you doing? Both what are you thinking and what action are you taking? And if they're in a conversation, what's the conversation, that kind of thing. So just to sort of show you an example of this, let's look at GPT-4, where I've done the same kind of thing that we can look at here. So we've basically got your AI behind an NPC game character called David Bourne. Now, this prompt I've just put in there, I'm sure their prompts are probably much nicer. And it, unfortunately, I don't think they've published all their prompts. But then we can take the, an example description like what they've done. Uh, and so here I've created this character. I've used some of their description from some of the other people in there. But I've made a new character, right? David Bourne is a restaurateur at the Jason's Sushi Restaurant on Brunswick Street, Fitzroy. And he's always looking to make the process of running his business easier for his customers. So we can see a little bit about him. He's married. We've got what his wife does. We've got his, his child here, what they're studying. And we can see also his relationships with other people in there. So then what I basically have done is set this up so that at each time step, I enter the command new time step. I want you to list the time of day and the action that David Bourne is taking in this conversation. And then I give it some examples, new time step, 6 AM, David is asleep, new time step. And then sure enough, it can generate, okay, 7.30, David is having breakfast with his family, new time step. Now in the game, I'm sure they're probably specifying actually when these new time steps, you know, if it's like every 10 minutes, every five minutes, that kind of thing. I mean, you can see the, the large language model is pretty good at sort of working out that, okay, at 7.30 a.m., you know, he's doing this. At 9 a.m., David is opening Jason's Sushi Restaurant and preparing the, for the day's customers. Okay, and then I basically say, if he's in a conversation, show us the conversation. So 11.30, he's taking a lunch order from his neighbor, and we can see that this is the conversation that occurred. That, hi, David, I'd like to have some salmon, sushi, please, of course, and get a sense of what's going on here. And we can see there's other conversations going on. We can actually then ask it to generate a whole bunch of time steps here. I've asked it to generate 10 between 3 p.m. and 10 p.m. And you can see, sure enough, it gives these in a nice order. And they make sense for the character that we've described that is David, is the restaurateur. You know. And so that's kind of what they're doing here once they create these characters is they're creating the, this idea of running it through in a timestamp. And actually later on, you see when they get to, I'll jump around a bit, you'll see they're creating this sort of, this is going into the, eventually going to go into the memory stream of where we can see, okay, a timestamp of what the character is doing at the various time, etc. So in the paper, they do talk about that you can actually go in as a character yourself and interact with people. And that will then change how they interact as well. Because just as I showed you making the David Bourne, you would have one of these for each of the agents. And each time they interact, 
this is where the memory comes in. So each of them has a memory of what they've done uh, and they can go through, they can update that, they can use that to plan for the next thing. So this example sort of day in the life gives them some of the key things that we were talking about with the time steps and stuff like that. They point out that you start to see these social behaviors. And for me, what the really interesting part though, is this kind of memory system. So let me look at the diagram and I'll go through it and explain what's going on. So each character perceives something in the world. So as we saw this get the, the GPT-4 explaining what David was doing, that's like him perceiving it. That gets put into the memory stream. And the memory stream will look something like this, where you've got timestamps with things that, that the character actually saw. It's then got to basically work out how to use these memories and how to take actions. So to do that, it's got a few different things. So it's got a way of retrieving memories, and we'll look at the, it uses waiting system to do this. And then once it's retrieved those memories, it either makes a plan. And if it makes a plan, that plan gets put back into a sort of memory of its own and, or it reflects on it. So the whole idea of the reflection is very cool in that it can take a whole, you can sort of think about the reflection as being like a summarization. So it can take a conversation that David has had with someone talking about something for work, and then it can summarize the key parts of that, that David needs to remember. And that will then go back into a sort of memory system there. And these retrieved memories, so this is sort of a loop going around, loops going around here. These retrieved memories are then used with the plan to actually decide what actions to take. Once it's got those relevant memories, once it's retrieved those actions, it determines the action and it takes the next step on this. So they go in, in quite in depth about how they do the memory retrieval for this. One of the cool things that they mention in here is this whole sort of waiting system of like, how do you actually remember, you know, how do you actually determine what to focus on and what's important kind of thing? So you don't want to remember everything because that's just going to clutter it up. And also the context span of the large language model is going to be too small for you to put everything in to that context span. Right. So they use basically a waiting system for doing this. And this brings up a whole interesting sort of thing as well. So they wait basically on recency. So obviously things that are more recent, you're going to remember more. So they use that. And then that decays over time. So further the time steps are you away from that happening, the memory of that will be less. They do the importance of something. So if something is important, then you're more likely to remember it. Also, the relevance is something that's going to determine you being able to remember something. If it's a relevant topic to you, you're more likely to do this. So you can see that these are the numbers that they're getting. The importance one is a really interesting one because how do you decide what's important? So they actually give you a prompt. I've taken this and we've put this into GPT-4. We can play around with this. So you can see this is the prompt on a scale of one to 10, where one is purely mundane and 10 is extremely poignant, rate the poignancy of the following piece of David's memory. So the memory here would be ordering cleaning supplies for his restaurant from the supermarket. That's going to get a rating of two. And then I say, okay, applying for a loan from the bank for a restaurant expansion. Now, this is something you would expect that would be much more important. Sure enough, it gets a rating of seven. Then I was interested to test it with things like that are more personal. So we can kind of elicit David's values in some ways here that, you know, David's son getting in trouble at school and David having to go to a parent teacher meeting next Tuesday, or well, that's a six for him. It's not as important as his expansion, but it's obviously a lot more important than him ordering the cleaning supplies. So each of these is just a sort of simple example, and this could be informed more by the character of David that we set up and we set up in his values in the prompt as well. And they may be doing something like that. The idea, once they've got this though, they're able to then sort of work out, okay, what do you actually pay attention to in these? And then from these memories, what gets passed to a language model to use for planning or to use for planning and taking action or for doing reflections. And this is where the reflections come in. So generative agents, when equipped with only raw observations, struggle to generalize or make inferences. So 
this makes a lot of sense, right? If you think about it, that when you look at something only at a surface level, humans don't really do that. We tend to think things through and think, how do they relate to other things in our life? How, you know, what information was more important, that kind of thing. And this is where the reflection comes in. So it can take things like conversations and actions and stuff like that. And it can reflect on the higher level, more abstract thoughts from this. This is where they basically generate more thoughts doing this. And this is done through, they talk about here using a prompt where given only the information above, what are the three most salient high level questions we can answer about the subjects in the statements? And they give some ex examples of talking to people, talking to this class smaller, and you know, he's obviously perhaps in the conversation, talking at a very low level, you know, about his research project and stuff like that. The high level stuff is that he's writing a research paper. He enjoys reading a book. He's conversing with th these people, right? There's different things that are, you know, much more high level. And they're kind of like the summarizations of the key things that we would pass into the language model for doing the planning and doing the action steps that are in here. Finally, coming to the planning and reacting, again, th this is done through having a sequence, you know, they generate a sequence of future actions for the agent and they try to, you know, the goal is to keep the agent's behavior consistent over time. A plan includes a location, a starting time, a duration. So that could be one of the characters going to the park and painting for four hours. So you've got the location, you've got what the actual action is doing, a starting time and duration in there. So they mentioned that like reflections, plans are stored in the memory stream and are included in the retrieval process. This allows the agent to consider observations, reflections, and plans all together when deciding on how to behave. So agents may change their plans midstream as well. So as they're doing these reflection things, as they're doing the planning, they're using this memory and they're sort of bringing it in there just through generating it. You can see in here, they've given some examples based on this, what would actually be some of the plans. And we can see that, okay, the plan might be to wake up, complete morning routine, go to college. So this is for the student, you know, work on the particular projects from this time to this time. It gives you a nice plan for this. And then that would be fed in with what we looked up earlier on to generate the next time steps. So the next time steps might change if they bump into someone, but if they're just by themselves, they're probably going to stick to their plan over time. And you can see this, they talk about, you know, re reacting and updating to plans. They operate in an action loop. So one of the big things is to understand this sort of game loop that's going on that at each point, like a new time is set and all the characters or all the agents go through and run their evaluation and their planning and looking at their action and return that, that actually is getting stored in kind of like a, a graph or a tree structure that's used to in JSON to actually plot all this out. So when we're looking at this, if I come down here, we want to find, let's say we find this character running around. This is actually all just using a game engine called Phaser that they're using to do this. Um, and my guess is that they've gone through, they may have made it from scratch or they've, they may have taken one of the tutorials and edited it. You can see there are some examples of tutorials in here of how to build something a little bit sort of like this. And using this, this is just, this is basically just rendering out from JSON. So they do talk about in here that the goal of what they're doing is that this environment is built with phaser that they're using JSON to actually store this and the sandbox it. And then they kind of flatten out the JSON for feeding it into large language models. So if there are certain things that, you know, they need from the JSON, they've obviously got some ways of deciding what they need and then taking those things and flattening them out. There's a lot of engineering to this, not just AI stuff. There's a lot of really interesting sort of engineering going on in here. And yeah, they talk about how they put all this together. It is interesting to look at the prompts that they use. So one of the things I haven't covered is the dialogue. So they've got a whole sort of dialogue system of where they're basically just sort of kicking it off with a prompt and seeing, okay, what do they get back from the dialogue? Those dialogues are fed into 
the memory of each of the agents that was involved in that dialogue. That's where you get things like the Valentine's Day party is a dialogue of where one agent says to another one, hey, there's this party, it's on at this time. And then that goes into the the person who's listening's memory, and then they're able to use that to tell another agent. That's how it actually happens as we're going through this. Anyway, I'm conscious I've gone very long on this video. I have a read of the paper. Just try, come in and try some of the ideas out in something like ChatGPT. They actually use ChatGPT, not GPT-4 for doing this. You can see that with just a little bit of playing with GPT-4, I was able to get this generating similar kinds of things. So it does show that this is something that you could go through the paper and reproduce if you want to. It's fun to just come back and look at the game itself and see what's going on, what they're doing. We can see what's this person doing. If we look down here, we can see, okay, this is where they are. This is the conversation that they've got going on. And we can see they're changing over time, right? So if I pause it, we can stop it and look at it. But we can see that if we follow one of these characters, we can see what's going on with them over time. Uh, and this is just being rendered from the JSON, right? That we're looking at. This is obviously, you know, probably not playing out in real time. It's being created first with the language models. I imagine that all the calls to the different language models might take a little bit of time, but once they've got this, they can then render out a whole day or something quite easily. All right. So that was the paper, Generative Agents, Interactive Simulacra of Human Behavior. Very cool paper, I think. Some really interesting ideas. You're definitely going to see this kind of thing happen and coming to sort of non-player characters in games. Also a lot of uses for simulation and interactive role play with humans. So allowing humans to try out different things before they actually do it in the real world is a really good use for this kind of technology. As always, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments below. If you, know, you found this video useful, please click like and subscribe. I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.